We are so excited about this lecture. As I said, the James Joseph Lecture is really the top award that APTI gives every year. It is about leadership and historical leadership in the field. So we are really pleased, and so many of us have been anxious to hear the sister speak to us tonight. I'm even more excited to hear the gentleman who's going to introduce her <laughs> speak to us this night, to, uh, to us tonight as well. So let me bring up Brother Joe Scanlberry to make the introduction. Two thousand of my steps in just now, <laughs> so I'm feeling pretty good. <clears throat> so let me do this very quickly. I'll tell you a couple of things. Uh, Cherise told me before um, I came down. She said, "Look, a couple of rules." <laughs> if y'all know Cherise, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so don't be long. Don't be dry. You know, you can go on, Joe. Now, some of y'all know that Cherise and I live in two separate cities, following the mission. And uh, if you ask Cherise, how y'all pulling that off? You might get a none yo, as in none of your business. <laughs> Politely said. So, I decided tonight to introduce Dr. Sharice West Scannelberry in a more personal way. And uh, Corey, you got room in your room just in case? All right, all right. So 17 years ago, August 2000, hot summer in Baltimore, I was a grant seeker. I was an attorney working with a grant seeker. And we were visiting the Annie e. Casey Foundation. And we had a wonderful meeting, and I expected us to get a grant. <laughs> <laughs> On the way out of the foundation, this young woman and her friends who worked at the foundation were coming back from lunch. She was wearing a... <laughs> yellow-red sundress. She was brilliant. I introduced myself as the general counsel of the particular nonprofit. And she immediately said, oh my god, you're an attorney. Ugh. So <clears throat> I st stepped back. I'm from Brooklyn, so that sounded like flirting to me. <laughs> so I got her card, <laughs> politely. A month later, I asked her to go out. She had no clue who I was. <laughs> but she was polite responsive like a good grant maker should be. <laughs> and so we had dinner. Little did I know that that would begin a 17 year relationship in which we would learn about servant leadership from Dr. Excuse me, Ambassador Joseph in South Africa. We would learn about struggle through partners and friends and family. We would learn about the role of faith in the fight for justice. We would learn about passion. Yes, passion for each other. <laughs> but passion, passion for people. We would learn about commitment, intellect, we would learn about the things that Dr. Sharice West Scannelberry will share with you tonight. Aww. 
Ladies and gentlemen, my wife, Dr. Sharice West Candleberry. Thank you all so, so much. <clears throat> and I'm actually going to save my thank yous for the end, because if I start now, we'll be here another half hour with me crying. So I'm trying to keep it together now. <clears throat> but I do want to say to Julia and Tanisha and Nat, you guys give me life. You guys are beautiful. I am so grateful to share the stage with you all. Congratulations on your awards. And I just look forward to continuing working with you. <clears throat> For most of my childhood, my mother, my sister, and I lived in the Murphy Homes, a public housing community in Baltimore, Maryland. I can still say my address, 725 George Street, apartment 8L. My phone number was 752-7589. We had to learn that in case we got lost. Growing up there, it was dangerous both inside and outside of my home. For example, to get to the elevators, you had to walk through brothers shooting up and, and sniffing glue. What I later learned was airplane glue. Eventually, there was an um, entrance, a plexiglass bulletproof entrance that was um, erected in the lobby. So, and we also had security guards and cameras. So the brothers who were in the lobby decided to take their thing to the stairwell. But the 725 Mafia Mamas, oh, they weren't having that. So who do you ask are or were the 725 Mafia Mamas? Now, that's not the name they gave themselves. That's actually what I call them. They were black women. They were mothers. They were like the Olivia Popes of the projects. They handled whatever needed to be handled. So when them brothers thought they would take it to the stairwell, them sisters was like, oh, hell to the no. <clears throat> they started patrolling and booting them out until they stopped coming. But they couldn't keep up with all the activities that were going on in the building. There was this man named Preacher who liked to offer little girls money to come to his apartment. Now, I don't know if he was an actual preacher, or if that's what we called him because he was religious and liked to carry a Bible and some tracts. Because, you know, if you carry some Bibles and some tracts, you, you a preacher. <clears throat> he could have been an usher or a deacon, for all we know. So he offered my sister and I money to come to his apartment. And we neither took his money, nor did we go to his apartment. But we, what we did do was we told on him. And we told on him, and so did other little girls in our building. So brother got a visit from the 725 Mafia Mamas. <clears throat> now, I have no idea what was said. I don't have no idea what they did. But what I do know is that every time that brother crossed our path, he diverted his eyes and ran quick, fast, in a hurry in the other direction because they handled it. The 725 Mafia Mamas, they were serious about protecting us. Now, I don't want to romanticize growing up in the Murphy homes because that was some hard living for a child and a preteen. I have no desire to relive the addiction and the alcoholism, the domestic violence, the fatherlessness. And so many kids and families were going through those same struggles, including the 725 Mafia Mamas, who we depended upon. But I'm grateful for that experience because it made me who I am today. I'm grateful to those women because they taught me when you unite to resist, you can change the culture of your community from one of living in fear to having just a little bit more safety. They taught me 
that we are empowered with the authority to make change in our communities and that we have the power to make that change happen. Living there gave me my purpose. I'm very clear that I have been put on this earth to work on behalf of communities like the Murphy Homes and to support women and organizations like the 725 Mafia Mamas. Real clear. <clears throat> And we've all met these women, and we've all met, met these groups and organizations in our own work. They are scrappy, yet resourceful. They are uh, 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 hard, radical, but they know what is best for their communities. These women were the boldest, baddest women in the Murphy homes. And I am so grateful for all that they did for us. Aligning philanthropic resources so that we can invest, or in order to invest, I'm sorry, aligning philanthropic resources so that we can protect, empower, and resist. Because of my experiences, that's personal for me. And it may be personal for many of you. And that strategy is a necessary strategy. And that aligning in that strategy, that has to work. And we have to make sure that that alignment works. Because now is the time. Now is the time to make that strategy work. Now, I know throughout the sessions and throughout the day and even uh, uh, earlier in the evening, we kept saying, now is the time, now is the time. And I even read previous JJL lectures imploring, now is the time. But the truth is, now really is the time. <laughs> now is the time, not just because I'm the lecturer this year, but now, <clears throat> now really, really is the time for the philanthropic sector to use its resources to further social change in the US. Now is that time. But to do so is going to require such a major transformation in who we are and how we behave as a sector. It's going to require radical, radical transformation. Because if we don't ask those questions, if we don't think about making that transformation, then we're going to lose this moment in time. So what does that radical transformation look like? Well, first we must ask ourselves, are we really ready to support resistance? Even when it's messy? because it's going to be messy. Are we really ready to protect diverse communities and their lived experiences? Are we really ready to, to, to empower grantees to have power and voice? Are we really ready for communities to influence the resources that go into and out of their communities? Are we really ready? Are we really ready to empower communities to be decision makers and to be at the table when those decisions are being made? And if we're not ready, why aren't we ready? And I'm not going to mince words here. We have colleagues in philanthropy who are deathly afraid of poor people having power and voice. <clears throat> We are deathly afraid in philanthropy. We have colleagues who are so afraid of black people having power and voice. I have been, I have been in philanthropy for 25 years. That's back when they was hiring 12 years old and teenagers. <clears throat> this is my silver anniversary in philanthropy. Over the years, I have heard colleagues say something to the effect of, you know, Sharice, the kind of change you're describing, girl, we want that to happen. We absolutely want that to happen. But if we fund communities to do what you just said, they might, they might, they might demonstrate. They, they may do an action. They may become confrontational. I've even had colleagues in philanthropy who said something to the effect of, if we fund a particular organization, 
who's doing organizing, who's resisting, who's empowering, who's protecting. If we fund that organization, aligning ourselves with that organization, we might be in the media. We, we may get negative publicity. People might talk about us. <clears throat> so I said to him, I go, okay, let me help me. Wait a minute, hold up, what'd you just say? <clears throat> let me get this straight. You would rather reserve your reputational capital than to help poor people? You would rather reserve your reputational capital than to pursue your mission? So that makes you part of the problem. <clears throat> and on top of that, even if you align yourself, you get in the paper, you get negative publicity, it ain't like nobody not gonna ask you for another grant again. I mean, I don't understand what's at risk here. <clears throat> I don't get it. <clears throat> now, I know many of us in this room, we fund social justice work and the like. I'm preaching to the choir, but I need y'all to take this message out to those who don't. Ask them, help us understand what is at risk. Because you're holding up money that we need. I, I don't, what is that, what, what's at risk? Your reputation is far more important. That's crazy. You need to cease and desist. <clears throat> And then on top of that, we have more excuses. Change is hard to measure. <clears throat> is there a return on investment from advocacy and organizing? <clears throat> and more excuses than that. I had the absolute privilege to be the founding CEO of, the, of, of what is now the Foundation for Louisiana. Yes, oh. <clears throat> yes. yes. A shout out to Fozell and the crew. Very proud of you guys and the work that you continue to do. <clears throat> As CEO, we were charged at that time to ensure all voices, all people were included in the rebuilding and the reconstruction post Rita and Katrina. So my team, Ashley and Samantha, y'all out there, because I can't see. What's up, y'all? <laughs> okay, sorry. Ashley and Samantha and then Landon eventually joined our team. We then went out and intentionally sought to fund organizations like ACORN and PICO. We intentionally went out to find community-based organizations that were doing policy and advocacy, neighborhood groups, civic groups. <clears throat> they were so under-resourced and so underfunded, which was in and of itself a challenge. But what I found even more astounding was some of our social justice grantees said to us, our grant was the first grant they had ever received from a Louisiana-based funder. The first grant. <clears throat> so that means they were not funding resistance, empowerment, and protection prior to then, prior then. And we even had that experience firsthand when the three of us, the four of us, were trying to convince in-state funders to partner with us, to co-fund organizing, advocacy, civic capacity building. It was like pulling teeth. So I asked the question of all of us, would we fund organizations like the 725 Mafia Mamas? Would we fund them to empower, to protect, to resist? in our communities. Because funding them, actually, by supporting them and by enabling them to make the sustainable changes that they need and want to make in that community, we have to support organizations like those. And that is movement building. So the second thing that I want to say is when we are looking at this transition in our field, the next thing that we need to consider, we need to put aside the need for perfect outcomes and instant gratification. <clears throat> perfect outcomes and instant gratification has the effect, in case y'all don't know, again, I know you know in this room, but we gotta tell others. <laughs> that need for that, inhibits organizations from taking a stand and speaking up. We need to get rid of the fear of the funder. 
Grantees who are working on immigration rights, they should not be afraid of losing their grant because they are demonstrating or organizing a rally or some of their members are undocumented. <laughs> Those who are working on health care policy should not be afraid to approach their funder and ask them to establish and fund a C4 organization because they need to be able to lobby against the well-resourced lobbyists who are trying to dismantle the Affordable Care Act. We need to figure out ways to fund those C4s because the policies that we care most about will continue to be sidelined and hobbled if we do not support C4 organizations. <clears throat> and those of us, those funders or those grantees who are working on the justice system, who are going aggressively after the justice system, they shouldn't be afraid to lose their grant because board members are friends with their judges and with the judges and lawyers that those folk are going after. And to my unity colleagues, <clears throat> now is the time to step in this moment and take leadership within your foundations. As was said earlier, we never had this many black and brown folk in philanthropy before. Now is the time to step into the leadership within your foundations. And I know it's not easy, y'all. I live in Arkansas. I know it's not easy. It is not easy working with or doing this or stepping into leadership with colleagues, board, board members who are conservative and not risk takers. But we can't stay comfortable in the big house. We can't stay comfortable here. Where are we taking a stand? Are we challenging our sector through our scholarship? We should be writing, publishing. We should be challenging the sector through scholarship, through critiquing. They need to hear from us. Our voice is vital. And quite honestly, they're looking to us for that leadership. And I know it's tiresome, I know it's tiresome, y'all, trying to be the leader and trying to tell folk and school people. I know, trust me, I know it's tiresome. <laughs> but we got to do it. Now is that time to do it. Because we, too, must get uncomfortable. We, too, must take the risk and the boldness we're asking others to take. Because staying safe in our cushy foundation positions is not going to change the world. Another transition that we need to make, another one, a transformation we need to consider. <clears throat> when we have white domestic terrorists who are unafraid to march in our streets and immigrants who are being stripped from their families and police killing unarmed black and brown citizens and Native Americans who continue to be abused by our government. Now is the time to talk about these hard issues in our institutions. And now is the time to talk about racism. <clears throat> now is the time to get over whatever the hell it is you got going on about it and talk about it. Because these issues are coming and coming, and as Brother Ness said, they're not going to stop. So we need to talk about these hard issues. And we need to be unafraid to talk about them. And unfortunately, we as people of color are going to have to take leadership around some of those conversations. But we have to talk about them. I co-founded an affinity group, an internal affinity group at the Annie Casey Foundation called Respect. All right, my respect folk, my respect folk in the house. So respect is the place in the foundation where we talked about issues of race, culture, and power. We were, our charge was to build the core capacity of our staff at the Annie Casey Foundation to work effectively in communities of color. 
Susan Taylor Batten was our leader of respect during the time I was there. Under her leadership, y'all, we was, we, was, we was on. We was on and popping. <clears throat> we challenged everything. We challenged everything from hiring practices to who were the consultants and the vendors to making sure that we used a racial equity lens in doing our grant making. We challenged everything. We were the first affinity group of its type in philanthropy, and respect is still going strong some 20 plus years later. <laughs> Doing that work within the foundation was not easy. Am I right, Susan? Am I right, Corey? Come on, Faith. It was not easy, but we did that thing because it was important for us. One of the products of respect is the Race Matters Toolkit. Another product of respect is that the Annie Casey Foundation has a director for race, equity, and inclusion, Nanette Sykes. <clears throat> now again, that was a 20 year long battle, but that's a whole nother lecture. <clears throat> but the important thing is we need more foundations to have positions like that, and we need, we need more Nanettes in our field. I had the, um, I was talking with a colleague this past summer who asked me, she called me about respect because she wanted to do something respect-like in her foundation. And when she called me, she said, uh, and, you know, we talked about respect, I told her about it, and she said, Sharice, we could never do something like that here. She approached colleagues, mainly white colleagues, in her, in her foundation, and she talked with them about a respect-like approach, and they shut her down. She was even so scared to go to her president to talk about this, to talk about starting respect. Now, I, I know that you all think that's an isolated incident, but again, I've been around 25 years. We may not want to talk about it, but that happens more often than not. In our own institutions, we are creating voicelessness and intimidating folks. We are creating the oppression that we're trying to stop in communities. So how can we effectively do community and movement building if we can't even get it right within our own institutions? I also work within a foundation where grant recipients were feeling so disrespected by their grants manager, by their program officer, that they called our director and asked if I could be their program officer. Again, I know y'all want to say that's an isolated incident. That happens way more often than not in philanthropy. We need to get our mm together. <clears throat> Again, how can we build movements? How can we support movements when we are intimidating, creating voicelessness, creating oppression, creating fear in our own organizations? We need to change that. Our communities need us to change that. And then my final transition, transformation, radical change we need to make is, Lord have mercy, we need to stop looking for the perfect grantee. <clears throat> we need to add to our portfolios those potential grantees who don't know what infrastructure, don't even know how to spell infrastructure. <clears throat> don't even know what a theory of change is. May or may not have a 501c3. We need to add those, those scrappy, uh, 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 barely off the ground. All they got is heart and passion. That's all they got. <clears throat> they ain't got nothing else to offer you but heart and passion. Because that is the backbone of movement building the backbone of movement building. At the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation some eight or nine years ago, one of the first grants that I made when I got there was to the Worker Justice Center of Arkansas. The executive director was 23 years old and he was the elder. <laughs> Since then, in the nine years that we've been funding them, let me, you, you heard correctly, we are a long-term funder in the time that we've been funding them, <laughs> They have reclaimed $920,000 
in workman's comp, discrimination claims, and the like, just through their advocacy on behalf of workers, mainly immigrant workers. We need more of those types of grantees in our portfolio. We need to take those risks. We need to add them to our portfolio. Again, because they are the absolute backbone of, of movement building. So I want to take this moment and acknowledge the power that we have. We have and we can create movements that have changed the course of history in the United States. The civil rights movement, the gay rights movement, the consumer protection movement. Many of those movements were funded by philanthropy. We can and we have changed the course of history. So let's join the resistance. Let's join that resistance. Yes, there is a whole lot of anger in that resistance. It's filled with anger. But so are many of us in this room. So why be afraid of it? Let's harness that anger. Instead of being afraid of it, let's harness that anger. Let's, let's join with our leaders. Let's join with those who are like the 725 Mafia Mamas. Let's join the DACA youth. Let's join that march in St. Louis right now. Right. Let's support the people who are on Standing Rock. Let's join, let's support them. I am very clear, my career is dedicated to communities like the Murphy Homes and to groups and organizations like the 725 Mafia Mamas. That is my calling. Today, I am calling on all of us whether you are a CEO, a program officer, or a board member, I'm calling on all of us to push boundaries in our foundations. I'm calling on all of us to be bold. I'm calling on all of us to get rid of whatever the hell it is you're afraid of in talking about racism and race in your institution. I'm calling on all of us to demand that we fund social justice within our foundations. I'm calling on all of us to ensure that our black and brown communities get the dollars they need and deserve to make the changes we need to make here in America. I'm calling on all of us to take up the charge that Tanisha talked about. I'm calling on all of us to behave like Nat told us to talk about. I'm calling on all of us, like our sister from the Crow, I know your name, but I like the name Crow, from the Sisters from the Crow told us to do. I'm calling on all of us to be bold. I'm calling on all of us to put pressure in our sector. I'm calling on all of us to do that. Because right now is that time. Right now is our moment in history. Not tomorrow, not next year, but right now. And let's answer that call. Let's take up that banner. And let's do it not just for ourselves, but for those communities, those babies, those families on which we purport to serve. Thank you so much.